I think we'll get started uh, two minutes early, which is, which is pretty rare for one of these symposiums. Um, but welcome, all of you. Welcome to the University of Chicago. I, I know a lot of you in the room, and thank you for, for taking the time to come here. Um, this, is, uh, this is always an event that's very special to me. Um, as, as you know, we have been so invested in the management, treatment, and hopefully cure of appendix cancer. Um, this is the day where uh, we get to obviously talk a little bit about what we're doing, but also hear from all of you um, in terms of how things are going, ask questions. Um, I think one of the things I shared with one of my patients is that today is also a day where um, it's very stimulating for our researchers. Today is the day where we have chemists, we'll have physicists, we have people over here that you wouldn't, they probably just sit in their labs and do the work that we tell them is important to do. But when you see a room full of people like yourselves um, who have either been affected by appendix cancer or have a family member that's been affected by it, um, I think it makes it really real for every one of us that, that does the work on this side. So thank you very much for taking the time to come. Um, I think the, um, you know, this event would not be possible without the support of the ACPMB and Carolyn. She's going to speak a little bit about this. We've had some other groups, the American Cancer Society and the Gildas Club, that have also contributed to, uh, to our being able to host this event today. And clearly, the University of Chicago uh, Cancer Center and our Department of Surgery, which have both helped us put this together. Um, so I just wanted to thank all of them before we get started. And I think I've been waiting for Pujita to come inside, but our, our manager, Pujita, who's really helped bring this event together, I think uh, it owes a lot of credit for, for all of this. So today, um, the event that we're hoping to, the way this will kind of work is uh, we're going to have some speakers. Um, we'll talk a little bit about advances in surgery, advances in chemotherapy, advances in sort of personalized medicine. We're going to have some panels that will talk about how do you detect appendix cancer early and what are the challenges we face with that, what is the research that's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about how do you live well with appendix cancer. So what are things that you know, we can all do um, to try to help uh, battle this? We're going to have a lot of uh, hopefully open time for questions. This hopefully will be somewhat interactive. Um, at any point, if you guys want to ask questions, you could just raise your hand. We have Justin and uh, Pujita. Um, who will be around with mics. Justin, do you want to just raise yourself and identify? And Pujita, the one that I thanked earlier who put this all together. So Justin and Pujita will be around uh, for you guys to ask questions. Uh, for those of you that are seated in the middle, it'll be a little bit of a challenge, I suspect, but, but we'll make it work. Um, just a few logistics and, and ground rules. We unfortunately don't have the Wi-Fi passcodes for, for this. It's the UChicago guest is the, is the network, but unfortunately we don't have the login, password type stuff, so we're going to try to get that for you guys. Um, we do have a Twitter handle if you guys tweet, so this would be hashtag UCM Appendix 19. So that's the, that's the hashtag for the Twitter. Um, the restrooms, as you may have seen, are around the corner to the right-hand side. Um, there are some um, unhealthy breakfast snacks that, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> that we would indulge ourselves in today. Um, so I think before we get started with, uh, with our first set of speakers, um, I just wanted all of us to take a moment of silence just to remember those that are not here with us today, uh, but have clearly had a significant impact um, on all of us. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll just take a moment of silence. Thank you. The, um, so I think... Um, you know, the University of Chicago, I've been here about three years, and I moved from Milwaukee. Um, and one of the big reasons I moved here was because of this, this intense focus that we have on treating metastatic cancer, treating uh, appendix cancer, and how can I get people around us to do this. So hopefully today during the day you get a good flavor of who these people are that help us uh, move the field forwards, and we would love to hear ideas and, and comments from all of you. Um, I think that's it for my introductory comments, um, Carolyn. So I know we're a little bit ahead of time, but, uh, but if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce uh, Carolyn Lewandowski, who's going to give a little update on ACPMP. You've seen the, the stations and booths outside. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Let's see if I can figure this out here. And... How do I start the show? <laughs> there we go. 
Ah, there we go. Probably this presenter wheel. Front stuff. There we go. That'll do it. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, a couple of thanks I'd like to put out before we start. Um, first of all, to Dr. Taraga. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this, but if you are his patient, it will not come as a surprise to you that Dr. Taraga is really a leader in this area in the treatment of this disease, um, sort of in, in a world that you don't get to see, but I've gotten to see from a patient perspective. Um, he is just doing all kinds of amazing things among our sort of small group of very, very dedicated surgeons and really sort of pushing treatment, diagnosis, research forward um, in a way that is just, is just amazing. So thank you so much for that and all the work that you're doing that kind of, I don't think the patients get to see, but I'm so glad I've gotten to see. And uh, thank you to Pujita, who is just a, a delight. I, I love working with you and you've done such an amazing job in this event the last two years. So. Um, I'm Carolyn Lewandowski. I am the COO and General Counsel of the ACPMP Research Foundation. I got into this in 2008. My husband was diagnosed with appendiceal cancer and PMP in 2007. Um, diagnosed at a very advanced stage. He was given three months to live. His first surgery, he had 45 pounds of tumor and mucin removed from his abdominal cavity. Um, and then proceeded to have a massive recurrence 11 months later. So he ultimately had three high pecs in three years with Dr. Sardi. And, Baltimore, a year of systemic chemo between the second and third. In the midst of all that, we got married and had a baby, so it was an incredibly crazy three years. But um, we realized at the time that there was no nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education of this disease. There were some really great support groups out there, but not a, a group that was dedicated in funding research, and that was something that we wanted to change. So we helped found the organization in 2008. Uh, and in 2018, I quit my job as an attorney and took over running the organization full time. And we brought on our first full time staff member, Lauren Smith, who you may have met if you were here last year. She was here on our behalf last year. So, who are we? We are a IRS designated 501c3 nonprofit. We were created in 2008 by a group of individuals who are all personally affected by this cancer. Um, so, either patient or caregiver. And we have two main goals. One is funding research to find a cure for this cancer um, and improving the diagnosis and treatment. And number two, educating patients and providers um, for just general awareness, understanding, treatment um, to improve the, the treatment and diagnosis of the disease. Uh, our board of directors, led by my husband, Jerry, um, but I do report to Jim, just in case you're worried about a conflict of interest. Um, Jerry and Susan are both patients, and then the other four are all caregivers. Uh, many of you may know Therese Sergis. She is a local um, who couldn't come today, but she's been an indispensable part of our, of our organization, um, along with the rest of the board. And then, for, as of new as of last year, we have four dedicated staff members now. Um, Lauren and myself, and then Deborah Shelton came on last year. Um, she is our medical liaison. She is also a full-time FDA regulatory attorney, so she's really given us a window into sort of that medical industry world that we, we really needed, and she's been a huge asset. Um, I can tell you, you will be among the first to know that she's actually going to be formally joining our board as of January, so we're really excited about that. And then Susan, along with being a board member, is also our IT director, and she's been a huge asset to the organization. Um, we also have an advisory board made up of medical professionals. So Dr. Lambert at Huntsman is our chair. Uh, Dr. Lowy and Dr. Sardi and Dr. Vontanopoulos, um, all probably familiar names to you, surgical oncologists. As of last year, we also added um, a pathologist. Dr. Mizraji is probably one of the foremost experts on the pathology of appendiceal cancer in the world, and he joined our board last year. And then Dr. Switzer, who is um, a medical oncologist, who is uh, one of the only doctors that I know of who's working on interperitoneal chemo um, from a medical oncology perspective, not with, um, along with surgery. So he's doing a clinical trial on that. So that is our very, very dedicated medical advisory board. They've been just fantastic and a great resource for us over the years. So what do we do? We aim to cure this disease. And we do it through funding research, educating patients and providers. And to do that, we need to raise money. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we do that later. Um, but research is really our main focus. 
and it's really where the bulk of our funds go. So we partner with um, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, which, of which we are a member and have been since our inception, and NORD administers the grants on our behalf. So what that means is that they're using an NIH grant process to make sure that these funds go to the highest and best use. And we have seen some incredible results from some research that we funded. I know a lot of you may be familiar with um, the Australian Bronac trial, the Bromelin trial, where they have developed a compound that dissolves the mucin. It's delivered interperitoneally. We funded that research, and it would not have made it to the clinical trial process without our funding. Um, we've also funded some really critical genetic research out of Wake Forest and UCSD. So we're funding some really, really critical um, research. We focus on just basic science, foundational research that can be used to support more studies, and more importantly, more funding. So one of the research um, studies that we funded in the UK, they were able to secure another $300,000 of funding that they would not have been able to get if they hadn't had our grant. So that's the kind of research that we're working on funding. We funded $1.2 million over the last 10 years, uh, $700,000 in the US, $500,000 internationally, and we've got another $100,000 going out at the end of this year. Um, we've got an extensive public research, I mean, um, published research log on our website. Uh, it is a lot of research funded by ACPMP, but a lot of research that isn't. If you're ever looking to sort of see what research is out there, it's a really good place to go and sort of see what all these amazing physicians and researchers are, are working on. And there's really been a lot of progress made since we came into the scene 10 years ago. Our other uh, main mission is education, and we do this to through two programs. Um, the first is what we're all doing here today is these uh, patient-physician regional symposiums. Um, we try and hold about three, give or take, per year. This year we were having four, and we sort of try and spread them around the country, um, sort of sometimes geared towards patients, sometimes providers, sometimes both. We've, we've done it both ways, but we think getting people together in a room in person, especially for a rare disease, is just very um, empowering and important. Um, we also fund scholarships for physicians to attend medical meetings. Primarily, we um, support the SOGI meeting every other year, which is an international meeting, and then the formerly regional therapy is now advanced cancer therapies meeting, which is an annual meeting um, now coordinated by the Society of Surgical Oncology. That meeting, we typically only funded about um, five scholarships, but this year we're doubling our investment to 10, and we're really excited to um, increase our support of that meeting. And Dr. Traga is very, very influential in that group, so um, it's a really good program. Um, this is what I really want to tell you about today. So these are four new programs that we've just developed over the last year. We truly believe that educated patients are empowered patients, and that's why you're here, and that's why we've developed these programs. Um, the first is a new patient guide. We realize sort of when you're first diagnosed, it's very overwhelming, so we've developed a new program that's just quick links to everything a new patient would want to know as soon as they get that diagnosis. Um, and then the second program, which Deborah Shelton's been really instrumental in developing, is a clinical trial referral page. We had heard from our surgical oncologists that they're not necessarily well-versed and up-to-date on clinical trials because they're really sort of a medical oncology world. And so they, they said it would be very beneficial if you have a web page with all the current clinical trials explain in plain language that patients can understand with direct contact information. So we have gone through the clinical trials database and culled through thousands of trials to have an up-to-date list of trials currently enrolling appendix cancer patients explained in a way that you can understand. And so if you go to that page on our website, you'll see all the trials and um, you can just reach out to the trial investigators directly. Um, a third project we're really excited about we partnered with a group called the Rare Cancer Research Foundation. They have a program called Pattern.org. What this is is a excess tissue donation project. So if you're going to have a surgery, it's a patient-initiated project. So you fill out a 10-minute application at Pattern.org, and Pattern.org will take care of the rest and coordinate with your surgeon to take excess tissue that you don't need and they don't need, for this project, it's sent to the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and they are growing cell lines from excess cancer tissue. If they are successful in growing these cell lines, they're going to put them into the public domain 
for any researcher to work on. And the benefit of this program is that it is fully funded by the National Cancer Institute. It's no cost to us, to you, or the institution. So it is a really, really important project. We have heard they have four samples. They need five to start growing tissue. And they had um, a fifth consent, but their surgery was delayed. So we're really hoping that some patients who have upcoming surgeries will apply for this. It is a super easy program. It is all upside. There's just no downside to it. So hopefully we'll get some more patients applying for that. And then finally, we have um, contracted with Nord to develop a patient registry on their platform, which has been really successful some, for some other rare diseases, but also so, for some rare cancers. And this is, again, a patient-initiated program. Well, you will sign up you will put your information in there, and you will help advance research for this disease by, by sharing your information. So that project's taking a little longer than I'd like to, but uh, we should hopefully have it up and running by the spring. So those are our four new patient empowerment um, projects. So how do we do all this? We do it by working together with other people and their groups. Um, we work with our fellow um, support groups and some other advocacy groups, um, especially NORD. We've, we've done a lot of work with them. And the Nord Cancer Coalition, they developed a, um, a specific rare cancer group within the National Organization for Rare Disorders, which, which has just been incredibly beneficial for us. We've really gotten a lot of contacts from that and learned so much from them. Um, our educational partners, SOGI and the SSO, primarily working with them to support their medical meetings. And then our research partners, some of our um, recipients of our grants have been multiple recipients and have just really pushed research forward and we've been able to be a partner with them in that and, and providing this funding. Um, and then the big question, how do we pay for it? Well, we need you. I mean, that's how we do it. 100% of our funding comes from patients, family members, and friends coordinating fundraising activities on our behalf. Um, so we have all kinds of interesting and fun events. Actually, some of you may know Carol Cox. She does the Forever Flowers. She actually just wrapped up that project, but she made these glass flowers and sold them, and she raised over $40,000 for us just doing that. I mean, it's just an incredible effort. Um, but anything you can think of, we can find a way to help you do it. So just reach out to us. Um, sadly, a large number of our funding comes from memorial donations, which every single day we're reminded of why we're doing this. And there's nothing more humbling and inspiring than someone who knew this wasn't gonna help them, but they wanted to help someone else. And so we never forget that um, every day that we're doing this. Um, and that's it, that's what we do, who we are. We're here for you. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime. And we are all over social media, so you can find us there. And we're all over, all over the country doing all kinds of interesting things and on your behalf. And that's it. Thank you all for coming. And I hope you get a lot out of today. That's it. Carolyn, that was fantastic. And, and for those of you that have more questions, there's a booth outside. And they also have a web page where, where you can get more information. So I think we'll start off our talks this morning. It's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Oliver Eng. Um, Oliver is an assistant professor of surgery. We were fortunate to recruit him after he finished his fellowship last year at the City of Hope Cancer Center, and he's been uh, with us now for over a year. Um, Oliver is also interested in uh, peritoneal metastases and appendix cancer, so he's my partner in crime, and together we're trying to uh, see if we can make, uh, make some headway here. Uh, Dr. Eng is going to talk a little bit about what's new in the surgical management of appendix cancer. Morning, everybody. So it's kind of interesting. Um, around this time last year, um, I had just gotten here, and one of the first things that I did when I got here was come to the first symposium. And it's incredible hearing the stories from, from everybody, but also what's even more incredible is that uh, there's more and more people uh, that have come um, this time um, compared to the last one, and, and it's, I think it's just it's, it's great and a testament to our program and, and you know, raising the awareness of this, um, of this disease. And so a little bit about me. Um, I'm, uh, I'm similar to a lot of you in the audience in that um, sort of when I was younger, I, I was a family member. Of, of somebody who had uh, cancer that had spread into the abdominal cavity. And so 
I know what it's like being in a lot of your shoes uh, and you know um, sitting in a, in, a, in a hospital room and watching somebody undergo surgery uh, for an advanced cancer that uh, when the first three physicians you, we saw at, um, at prominent institutions said there was nothing that can be done. And so, you know, I was younger back then. I, I didn't really make it uh, sort of a life mission to come back to this, but then sort of serendipitously end up doing this and now treating the same cancers that I saw on the other side of the, on the other side of, you know, of perspective. And so um, I definitely can, can relate in a lot of ways to, to many of you here. Um, uh, I was recruited here from um, Los Angeles, which, so I'm proud to say I survived winter. <laughs> um, but my wife still reminds me every day of the temperature in Pasadena as opposed to here. So, um, you know, that's a work in progress. But, um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been, again, an honor to be here. And, um, you know, and, and certainly I had gotten to know Dr. Turaga on a national level because we attend the same meetings, we speak at the same meetings. And, um, you know, uh, when he was looking for somebody to be a partner in crime, I was like, sign me up. And we're, we're, we're in the fight together to, to, with all of you to, to help advance um, the management of this disease. And so a little bit of what I'll talk, most of what I'll talk about is surgery related, but then I'll touch upon a couple of new things that have come across the horizon um, since we started. And so I think, um, you know, first we'll talk about just in general surgery for appendix cancer, you know, what kinds of surgery do we do and, 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 and how is it done? Um, but then um, for patients who have advanced uh, appendix cancer, or appendix cancer that has spread into the abdominal cavity, we do talk about you know, these terms you hear all the time, cytoreductive surgery, HIPEC. Um, and then um, we'll actually, I'll show some pictures and a short video of how we actually do it. And then we'll talk about updates and um, new, new updates in management or things that I've been doing um, since I've been here um, um, that I think we offer that uh, a lot of other places do not. And so surgery for appendix cancer, I think it starts fundamentally with, you know, there are different types of appendix tumors, and uh, I'm sure many of you in this room have uh, one of these or even something that may not even be listed here. And so, um, you know, that's why appendix cancer, it, it used to be way back about a couple decades ago, people lumped in appendix cancers with colon cancers because, oh, it, it you know, it hangs off the colon, it's probably the same thing. And, 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 and colon cancer is a lot more common. And so honestly, with a lot of the data that we use to, to treat appendix cancer is extrapolated in a way because colon cancer is just more common. But at the same time, we've also learned that these cancers behave differently. And all of these cancers behave in subtly different ways. And it's, you know, and thankfully, we're at a place where we see so much of it that we understand how to treat these and the differences in how you approach them. And so it's definitely important, and this is a recurring theme that you'll see today, is that it's really important um, to have a team that understands these cancers and how to treat them in a way that is tailored to you individually. Because as I tell all my patients, everybody's cancer is different. Everybody's journey is different with the cancer that they have. And, you know, you can look at the numbers, you can look online, you can, you can look at, you know, everything that's out there. But who's to say where you fall in that whole spectrum of everything? Because everybody's journey is different. And it's just really hard to say. And so who gets surgery? Well, you know, people who have localized disease, localized appendix cancer to the appendix, you know, they get surgery. But also, again, like I touched upon, patients who have advanced or metastatic disease, you hear these terms, peritoneal metastases, pseudomyxoma, peritoneae. You know, again, these are things that many, many years ago people wouldn't even consider operating on. But this is something that we operate on um, nowadays, and it's part of the, the treatment algorithm for how we, we care for patients. But again, this is done in a setting where you have surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists who really uh, collaborate together to make a decision that's best for you. And so, you know, what types of surgery are there? And uh, as you know, the, I always tell my patients, the appendix cancer is a little, it looks like a little party balloon that hangs off of your cecum and doesn't really do much. And so you can actually just cut off the party balloon sometimes, and it can often be done laparoscopically. And so this is just a, a, some, a graphic that I found online where you can actually grasp the appendix and you, you cut off its blood supply and you cut off the appendix and then put it in a bag and, and that's it. Uh, um, you know, it's, it'd be nice if it was always that easy. Um, uh, and then with certain cancers, it may require that part of your colon is removed. 
in which case um, the right side of your colon, this is, this is right, um, this is left, and so the right side of your colon is removed and then you're reconnected. Um, a lot of times because what we've learned in that is that the, the appendix uh, cancers, um, the first place they go to a lot of times is lymph nodes and they share the same lymph nodes as that right side of your colon. So to actually get a sense of if the cancer is in that area or not, again, this varies from cancer to cancer, you may need to have the right side of your colon removed um, as well. So then this is a picture of, uh, of, of, of um, pseudomyxoma, and this is, this is mucus that's in the abdominal cavity. And again, this is something that years and years ago, nobody would, you know, people would open you up and say, okay, well, there's nothing to do. We're gonna close you up and that's it. And, you know, since then, since Dr. Sugarbaker and other pioneer, pioneers of the field started doing this uh, in the 80s and 90s, we've, we've begun to learn that, you know, there is a role for surgery, and in fact, uh, surgery can provide long-term outcomes and potentially even cure for people uh, with this kind of disease process. And so, so, you know, this is called cytoreductive surgery, and HIPEC is heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, uh, which is utilized in this setting as well. So what is that? Like, what is it, you know, uh, what is cytoreductive surgery? What is HIPEC? Why do we do it? Who gets it? So um, we actually uh, have developed over time a way to quantify the amount of disease that's in your abdominal cavity. It's like, you know, how, you know, yeah, you see disease, you open somebody up and you see disease inside, but there's actually a numerical system that we use um, to, to say, okay, the cancer's here and here, and we, we, we separate into not, uh, nine different areas of the abdomen um, based on the location, but then also four more based on the, the um, level of the small intestine that's involved, and they all get a number based on their size, and location, then it adds up to a total score, and so we, you know, we call it the PCI score, and that's off, that's a score we often use in a bunch of different cancers, in, including appendix cancer, to determine, you know, uh, do we do surgery uh, first? Do we use high pec? Do we use chemotherapy? And these are all decisions that um, that we'd make in, in in conjunction with each other, and so. Um, but it's interesting because the, the concept of going in and cleaning out tumors uh, is not actually that new. They actually started doing this in ovarian cancer in the 1930s, if you can believe it or not, um, which is you know, certainly a long time ago. And, and, um, but then, then uh, in the 50s and 70s, uh, people are starting to see improved survival with cleaning out tumors uh, and with cytoreductive surgery in patients with pseudomyxoma. Um, and the first patient actually received a, a HIPEC in 1980. And so this was done in some trials in the 1980s, but it really wasn't until the 90s where uh, Dr. Sugarbaker actually published a paper that was called Peritonectomy Procedures, which he actually described um, what he did during these operations and in a way that actually we could read and, and, and adapt and, and try and do our best to um, you know, provide the best sort of uh, care in terms of the way we do surgery in patients. And it, the, the field is, has definitely evolved and since then, but um, what, what I want to emphasize is that when people talk about, oh, I'm getting a high pec, you know, um, it's, sometimes it's a little bit misleading because high pec is actually only one part of this whole puzzle. And this is, um, this is actually uh, the graphic that Dr. Traga put together a while ago, and that cleaning out tumors in, entails the surgery itself entails removing a lot of times the peritoneum or the lining of your abdominal cavity. So we talk about what is a peritoneum. The peritoneum, as many of you know and have this conversation, is like if you have a house, you have paint on the walls on the inside of the house. It's like the paint on the inside of your house. You can take the paint off, but the house is still there, and it's fine. And so, you know, but that, that lining of the, of the abdominal cavity co covers a lot of organs as well. And so these tumors tend to latch onto some of these, the, of the lining on the organs too. So in some situations, it does require resection or removal of part or, some, or all of some of these organs that you can remove. And, and in order to clear the disease to either, uh, you can't see, not being able to see it anymore or really small amounts. But... So peritonectomy and all the, these um, potential resections or cleaning disease off these surfaces is all part of cytoreductive surgery, and HIPEC is just one piece of this whole puzzle. And, um, you know, we talk about HIPEC in, in that there, it's heated chemotherapy, it's heated to 180 degrees, it's circulated in your abdomen, and it's done because there are studies that show that the, the putting the chemo directly onto these tumors can actually penetrate the tumors to a ser several millimeters, and they get to the tumors directly rather than trying to get there from the veins, which is much, much less effective. 
And this is, a, this is just a graphic of, um, of the HYPEX system, and I know this is cartoon, but this is a perfusion circuit, and um, basically um, water or saline, uh, this is again when you're in the operating room, and, and we, um, we put catheters in, and it flows in and out in the system, uh, going about a liter a minute, and we infuse chemotherapy into the circuit so that it circulates uh, through this whole system uh, for about, in appendix cancer, for, for 90 minutes. So how do we do cytoreductive surgery? And this is actually uh, a paper that was recently published from, from our uh, group here, and, and with, uh, with uh, nice graphics uh, illustrated here. So, uh, and I'll show a video after this that demonstrates how we do this in, in, in real time. And so this is, this is, uh, this is in somebody's abdomen. Uh, this is their, their head is up here, their feet are down here. This is their left side, and this is their right side. And this is after making an incision um, and this is actually looking at the peritoneum, so the paint on the walls. This is actually looking at it from, from the outside. So, so, it's, it's, so your organs are underneath all this, and this is the peritoneum here. And, um, and this is how we begin to free the peritoneum off of the abdomen itself. And so, as you can imagine, it's like this sort of like envelope around a lot of your organs. And so when we, um, we, we take it off the abdominal wall, eventually we open this up and then from the inside, peel it off the organs on the inside. So this is how it looks. And this is, some, this is a, um, a spleen and this is the diaphragm. And this is what the diaphragm actually looks like when the peritoneum is taken off of it. This is the diaphragm muscle itself, but usually the diaphragm has this sort of glistening coating over it. Again, it's like, just think of it as paint. Usually the diaphragm has paint over it. Now the paint's off, and this is the muscle itself. And um, I know these are just, it's, it's hard to know what, what we're looking at here, but again, uh, this is on the right side. This is, this is also diaphragm on the right side in the liver, and this will make a little bit more sense hopefully when I show the video. Um, and again, just imagine that there's like a glistening capsule over all of this that has now been taken off. And we're able to do this in the majority of situations without actually resecting organs. We're actually able to take the peritoneum off um, um, and, and, and that actually um, helps patients recover faster. Um, this is another example of, of having the peritoneum taken off. And then in the pelvis, uh, again, the, the, this is just taking the peritoneum off the pelvis, and your, this is your colon and your rectum and, 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 and bowels here. And, um, it, and we take the peritoneum off, again, stripping the lining off and, and taking it all in one block. So, this may make a little more sense if we show the video, but uh, before I do that, this, and this is an example of what HIPEC looks like. Uh, it's, it's really just, um, these are two methods which you can do it, and it doesn't matter how you do it. We do it this way, where uh, we, we close the abdomen and put the catheters in, and then you know one catheter, the, all the fluid's going in, one it's going out, and then it's just a circuit that, that keeps going around, and then once the, the HIPEC part is done, uh, we, we flush the abdomen out with about six liters of water or saline, and then flush the chemotherapy out afterwards, and then that's the end of the operation, essentially. So uh, this was actually a, a, a nice uh, video that was done by one of our fellows uh, before I even got here. Um, I'm showing the, um, how, how we approach uh, taking tumors off of the right diaphragm. And so I won't go through the whole thing, but you can, as you can see here, this is somebody um, who had disease along their right diaphragm. So this is somebody's liver. And then this is the inside of the peritoneum or the lining. Again, the lining of the abdominal wall. This is looking from the inside, okay? And these are, these are, this is all to cancer, lining the, um, lining the uh, inside, of, lining the peritoneum from the inside. Um, and so the, so the objective is to take the peritoneum off and, you know, it's not like we go in and, and, and actually scrape out little bits by little bits. It's actually we remove that whole thing. And so this is, um, you know, getting into the abdominal cavity. And then um, this is actually using heat to, to, to separate. This is the peritoneum and this is the abdominal wall. We're actually separating the lining like, we, like in that picture off of the abdominal wall. And... Um, and so this is the diaphragm muscle that uh, we had, I showed you in the, in the graphic before. And as you can see, we're taking the whole thing off in sort of like an envelope um, to get all the tumors off um, at the same time. And so the, the way they used to do it in the olden days, they would actually just kind of rip it off and, 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 and um, it'd be a lot more bloody. And so, so now we've de de developed ways where we actually use heat and, and sort of you know, burn these like tiny, tiny blood vessels at the same time. So you actually don't have a lot of blood loss at all when this is being done. And so, um, 
uh, we're proceeding here and cleaning it off the surfaces. And I'll, just start, I'll try to move it along a little bit. But as you can see, these are the diaphragm muscles pulling away from the peritoneum itself. And then uh, this, is, this is, again, now we're, now we're going from below, but we're actually like lifting up on the organs and trying to uh, take the peritoneum off and uh, continuing to do that. And we'll, yeah. So again, this is, this, is, this is the thing, is that a lot of times, um, you know, people who say they do this, they, they kind of cherry pick tumors off, and in and, 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 and reality, you, you need to take the whole envelope of peritoneum off, because leaving it in, in this disease in a lot of situations, if you leave some of it, this is a sort of a nidus for where tumors can actually come back. And so, uh, so again, we, this is taking this whole peritoneum off, and um, let's see. At the end of it, sorry, it's like five minutes, so I'm just trying to, okay. So then, so at the end of it, this is taking the remainder off the liver, um, and then once you actually take off, you actually take it off as one, one specimen itself, and, and then you, 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 you pass it off, and then our pathologists uh, look at it. And so the same approach is taken um, on the right side, the left side, and the pelvis, and we, again, try our best to take that, that whole thing off. And this is what, things, what it looks like at the end, where that lining has been removed. And so now you can see the muscle in the diaphragm, you can see the, the, the fat over the kidney and the liver, and it's completely stripped of that peritoneum or lining. Um, and so that's how we uh, will approach uh, disease that's, that's, for example, on the right side. Okay, so um, that's one way we do it, and, and as you can see, that, that required a big incision. And um, something that I do that, um, that I brought here over from, from, from uh, where I was before was that um, since I've been here, I've done a couple of these actually with the robot. Um, that's definitely a new thing that's, that's been um, sort of on the, on the, 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 the horizon with, with these, with these um, surgeries is trying to do things more minimally invasively. And um, I've done actually a bunch of these types of operations laparoscopically as well, uh, but we are now applying the robot to these types of patients. And I've had a couple of patients who we've done small, you know, again, it's, it depends on the patient and it depends on the amount of disease, but um, patients who have had small volume disease in one area of the abdominal cavity, um, I've done a couple of these where patients have left the hospital the next day. So, um, so it's and you, about maybe five or six incisions like this big, and uh, patients, you know, pain is uh, is much better controlled. Uh, you know, they're they're happier. Um, but you know, obviously, uh, uh, our patients here uh, do really well, even with big incisions too. It just depends on, you know, the the type of the situation and the amount of disease. Certainly, when there's disease all over the abdominal cavity, it's. Um, you know, it's pretty difficult to, to do all that through a bunch of small incisions. And so, you know, in, the, in certain patients, we are actually doing this now, too. Um, this, these are a couple articles that have uh, come out, and I don't, you know, focus too much on, on all the, like, there may be some jargon here, which um, you may not uh, uh, understand, is um, there, there's a movement in surgery to, towards what's called enhanced recovery after surgery pathways. And so um, it used to be when you had surgery, like in the 19... 40s or 50s, um, everybody basically said that when you're, you know, when you're in surgery, um, you need to get a lot of fluid um, because because you're going to lose a lot of blood, and you, you know, and that, the, the data was from you know World War II where people would get shot and 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 be bleeding out, and then people found that people lived longer when you actually got transfusions and and got a lot of fluid. Um, but since then, we've learned that like. You know, in a, in a war setting where you're actually actively losing a blood, it's a lot different than in a controlled setting in the operating room where you're not. And what happens, what we've learned over time is, is that when you f give people like a ton of fluid and you, and you, um, you manage people uh, like in a way that you, you, you leave a tube in their nose all the time and, and then they, you wait for them, for, for them to pass some gas before you take the tube out, all these things actually add to people's length of stay and actually prevent bowels from, from, from coming back to work as quickly. And so this whole movement on enhanced recovery after surgery is basically progressive um, um, uh, management after the operating room. So in a lot of our patients, we don't leave 
these tubes in the nose. We actually start let, we actually let our patients start eating the day after surgery, and that's actually shown to be associated with improved outcomes. And so this is this is just a study that was recently published uh, that demonstrated this. And and all all you need to know is like the, the yellow lines uh, are are what happened after you know these kind of programs implemented versus the blue. And as you can see, the 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 the, the amount of opioids people need, the the amount of complications they have, and the actual hospital stay is much less. And so traditionally, um, in recent literature, the average length of stay for patients who have this kind of procedure in the United States, they're in the hospital for about two weeks. Um, at our hospital, they're, they're on average here for six days, okay? Um, so, it's, so it's less than half of the na um, national average. Um, and a lot of institutions, patients routinely go to the intensive care unit after they have a surgery like this. Only 3% of our patients actually go to the intensive care unit after we do these surgeries. And Readmission rates in the country are anywhere from 25% and upwards, and our readmission rates are about half of that, if not less, uh, more recently. So you know, we, we, have, we have a pathway. I tell my patients, you know, um, you know we, have, we have brilliant uh, residents, fellows, uh, uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, but honestly, like after we do these surgeries, when, when they go into the computer to put in the orders for a patient, it's like it just, they, just, they just type the word HIPEC in, and it's like they click a button, and the whole thing pops up. Like it's really like you don't need to do anything. You just you click one button and the whole thing. There's a whole pathway that um, that all our patients are on. We have nurses that are trained specially to take care of patients who have cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. We have the same operating room team that, that helps us administer the HIPEC and do these surgeries. So everything is streamlined in a way that we know how to take care of patients who um, who have this type of surgery. And I believe we do the best to, to do that. And um, and and sort of reflecting that, uh, we, um, uh, last year, we convened uh, the, the top experts in the country uh, to put together guidelines for diseases, including um, appendix cancer, because uh, there are not in national guidelines for diseases like yours. And so um, these are actually going to be published, hopefully, very, very soon. Um, and we've developed the consensus guidance for, for the United States, essentially, for all these different um, diseases, which, oops, um, which include appendix cancers uh, with the disease that is spread in the abdominal cavity. And so um, once these roll out, these are, are sort of a primer for the entire country and anybody who treats this cancer on how it should be done. And, you know, again, we developed this here, and this is just, this is, I know this is like super complicated, don't, don't even try and like decipher this, but like, but these are pathways for physicians and, 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 and um, who are involved in treating patients with this disease. It at least gives them some, you know, and again, some guidance on how to manage these complex situations. And this is based on all the data that exists in the literature. Um, and then, you know, sort of leading into the next talk uh, by Dr. Polite, I, I think what's actually more and more interesting is we've, as, as I said, we've begun to discover that appendix cancer behaves differently than colon cancer, so it's a completely different thing. And there's been a lot of data that's recently been published, which is now beginning to show that even more and more. And this is even from 2014, where they started to discover that certain mutations uh, like are, are specific to appendix cancer, and you can now profile these tumors um, and understand the mutations that make up these tumors, and that can help guide you know, what therapies you actually can offer patients who have these tumors with these specific mutations. And so, um, and this is a study that was recently published a couple weeks ago, again, which talks about these types of, you know, KRAS and these things, these are types of mutations that these tumors have, um, again, which is useful information because in this era of treating cancer, like I talked to you about initially, you know, everybody's cancer is different, everybody's care should be individualized based on your cancer, and everybody's journey is different. And, and that same token, um, understanding what makes up your cancer, what mutations comprise your cancer, can help us give a little bit more information or a lot more information about how we should approach it and treat it. And that's something we also do routinely here is that we look at these tumors, not just looking at it, just you know, taking a picture of it or something. We actually will we'll look at the mutations of these tumors to decide, are, is, there, is there a therapy that may work better for you? Are there potential clinical trials that work better for you? And Again, this is just another slide showing that. And that's the other thing that we've, we're generating here, too, is actually we are starting, uh, we're taking off in terms of the actual clinical trials that we're offering patients here for appendix cancer, for other cancers where, that have spread in the abdominal cavity. So it's a very exciting time for us 
um, both on, a, on treating patients like yourselves, but also from a research standpoint to drive this field forward to pursue more and more cures. So um, with that, you know, thank you for your time and I appreciate um, you coming today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Oliver. I think, you know, as, as you can tell, you know, we're, we're very passionate about this. Um, I think some of the advances I would like to just re-highlight a little bit is, number one, if we can find the cancer early, we can apply minimally invasive techniques to this, such as laparoscopy, robotic surgery. So I think that you'll hear some of this in the flavor in the later part of the symposium in terms of what are the efforts we're trying here at the University of Chicago to find these diseases early so we can apply them properly. Um, the second thing is also, you know, we're, we're trying national leadership and trying to bring everyone, you know, the, the community that does this, as Carolyn said, the surgeons that do this, the medical oncologists that do this, um, and, and our, all our patient advocacy groups, we're all very united in trying to help this, and I think your support always helps. Um, so things like the Chicago consensus that we put together last year really made some forward progress for how do we take care of patients, how do we standardize this, because I'm sure all of you will share stories of you went to see a doctor, the doctor maybe gave you wrong information about your disease, and it's not the doctor's fault, but it's usually the fact that we don't know enough about this disease and we haven't taken the time to educate people about it. So I think this is a big, big endeavor that uh, we were fortunate to be part of. Um, and the third thing, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Carmen Gentry is here in the, uh, in the audience right now. Carmen, if you want to just stand up and, and be acknowledged. Um, you know, just so you know, just to what Dr. Ang had said, we have a dedicated team here. Carmen is a, actually an operating room nurse, and she might have met many of you in the, in the room um, who have had surgery with us here, um, and you probably don't even remember her. But, you know, her dedication is to, to our patients that have these, um, these cancers and the surgery, and there's many like Carmen who are here. Um, so I, I might give Carmen a moment to just kind of say a few words about what should patients think about when they come to the operating room or... Good morning. Um, I know that a lot of times for uh, the surgical staff, patients get to see us for about five minutes when they're awake and their family members, we get to see them for even less time. And we know that it's very, it's, it's a scary feeling knowing that your family member and even the patient going into surgery, it's surgery itself, no matter how minor or how major a procedure is, it's a, it's a very scary feeling. But like Dr. Turaga said and Dr. Ang said, we have a dedicated team and we really take pride in taking care of the patients as a whole, making sure that the family members are updated every two hours, just keeping everyone informed because it is a very intense feeling, just not knowing what to expect. But we pride ourselves in giving the utmost care that we can possibly give, just reassuring the family that is waiting on the other side, that we are taking excellent care of their loved ones, and it's just something that, you know, this is why we go into the field that we're in, because we want to be able to see the success and the progress that this whole journey has taken place. I've been a surgical nurse for over 30 years, and like Dr. Eng said, you know, years ago, you know, patients would be, you know, opened up and, you know, closed back up because there was nothing that could be done. And it's such a great feeling to be able to be part of this journey where there is hope that there is progress in terms of the types of cancers that are being treated. So it is an honor. Thanks, Carmen. I think we might have time for one question, if anyone in the audience has a question or a comment. Um, Yep. And so I was wondering, was there a lot before that? Um, because as um, a family member by someone who was impacted, you see a doctor, there's something abnormal, the general surgeon gets called, surgery takes place, pathology, you find out, you know, something's not right. Um, I'm wondering, are you studying the outcome? Like in breast cancer, you have screening. You find something abnormal, you go to a surgeon who So I'm wondering, are you guys studying, you know, if 
are lucky enough that he uh, referred to someone for their initial surgical contact who has experience in this versus someone who doesn't and gets referred at a later date. Are there differences in outcomes when you're looking at that? So, um, yeah, um, so I think, no, those are great questions. And I think, you know, I think it all comes back to the rarity of this because that, that's the problem is that like, so there is, you know, we're, we're trying to look at moving the moving things forward in the sense that the guidelines actually, there's there's actually a written part of the guidelines that are that are adjunct to the, 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 the pictures. And you now we do encourage anything that is incidentally found at the time of surgery for patients to be referred right away to providers like us who actually deal with this um, more frequent basis. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of times patients present with appendicitis or something like that, and, and, and a lot of times you don't know on a CAT scan because it's too small or because, you know, I would say it happens quite a bit where patients undergo an appendectomy for presumed appendicitis, and, you know, it does take pathologists, you know, a week, week and a half to, to look at it, and they, oh, say, oh, there's a cancer there. We didn't know that, you know. And so th I think the next challenge, like Dr. Torga talked a little bit about, is like how do we move that bar forward? Because then how, you know, with, with breast cancer and colon cancer, there's screening, but for this, there's not. And so I don't know, I don't think, you know, because you can't even see it when you, with somebody has appendicitis, for example, on a CAT scan, you can't even see the tumor a lot of times. So, you know, a lot of times is imaging, is better imaging the answer? Maybe, but we don't really have that capability right now. And so, you know, we are actually working on several projects now which are trying to move the field forward, such as, for example, blood tests. You know, are there, is there a role for looking at you know, certain molecules in the blood that could potentially um, provide earlier detection. And, you know, these are things all in progress. So, so certainly that's something we are moving towards. Uh, we just don't have a lot of good answers right now. I don't, you know. No, I, I think the points are correct. You know, it's appendicitis, so very often it becomes sort of like an emergency. But I think to your point, this is very important. This is something where we as advocacy groups and physicians that treat this need to do a better job, no question. And I think one part of our guidelines is clearly just kind of established. Right now we don't even have... This is finally the first time after Dr. Sugarbaker started this in 95 that as a group we have consensus on how to treat these. Like even those of us that are specialists, we always had varied ways of treating it. So now finally we're coming to a common place. And the next step is really how do we educate and disseminate this to the general surgeon. So when they look inside, if there's something unusual, they see something that's off, or if we have preoperative imaging or tests that actually help us know that there's something off, that they have an immediate trigger to say, uh, maybe we should right. you know, have six That's exactly right. Correct. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds are not. Two-thirds are not. Only a third are. That's right. And even those third can be converted to non-emergency. So there's things we can mm -hmm. chat. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Eng. <laughs> it's my uh, privilege to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Blaise Polite is uh, a medical oncologist. Um, he is, is not, uh, not just your ordinary run-of-the-mill medical oncologist. He is uh, one of the leaders of medical oncology, not only at the University of Chicago, but also nationally. Um, he is the deputy section chief of the uh, section of hematology oncology. He also holds national positions at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, has a whole life of himself about how he takes care of providing appropriate and optimal care for patients across the, the spectrum. Um, but most of all, he is probably one of the most brilliant medical oncologists that I've met. He is one of those guys that can, can look at a problem, try to figure out what the best next steps are. Um, and he is someone that has really given us the strength, Dr. Eng, myself, and all of us that do appendix cancer work, to keep doing what we're doing and more. So it's my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Blaise Polite. When I hear introductions like that, I always say, my, my mother would be proud and my father would wonder who the hell you're talking about. Um, so, <laughs> Kieran, thank you, thank you for that. First of all, I, I, I really want to thank you all for, for being here. It, it's actually some of the most humbling talks we give is, is in front of patients and families um, because this is real to you all. I mean, often we give talks to national audiences and, and other academicians and, and scientists and while they have a passion for it, it doesn't have the, the, the reality that it has to all of you. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for taking the time to learn. 
um, and for allowing us to learn from you, um, because we really do pay attention, not only at a scientific level, but we learn so much from patients telling us things that we do in the hospital that are just downright stupid. Um, and I spend a lot of my time looking at things that are stupid and, and try to get us to change. And, uh, you know, and I think a lot of the stuff that Oliver talked about in terms of, you know, the way we used to do post-operative management and keeping people in beds and not letting them eat for, you know, a week and a half, you know, and patients looked at us and said, why are you doing this to me? Um, and, you know, it's because that's the way we always did it. And we've learned from you that that's, that's not the right thing to do. You are also our, our evangelists, right? You're the ones that go out there and people will be coming to you often before they come to, to any doctor and saying, hey, you know, I have, you know, my husband, uh, friend, coworker has this diagnosis, and you're the ones that say, you know, this is something that needs to be seen um, at a specialty center. And, and that is really what we're, we're dedicated to here. And, and the reason this is our mission, as I think you've heard already, and you'll continue to hear throughout the day, is because of the team that is involved. Not any one of us by ourselves would really be able to help the patient truly. Um, it is everywhere from, as you've heard, the preoperative nurses, the nurses in clinic, our nurse practitioners, our dietitians, our palliative care specialists, our social workers, to the scientists that you'll meet today that are thinking about all this. It is our obligation, right, to learn from every single patient. Um, and places like this are dedicated to that mission, that, you know, if we see you, um, when we ask you questions, we have you fill out forms, when we ask you to sign consents, it is because we are trying to learn from every single patient, because as you'll see from my talk, unfortunately, there is a dearth of data um, on what is the best way to take care of a pedicel. You know, we've put together a consensus, but even there, it is not at the level that, of course, breast and colon and, and others sort of have in mind, so you'll see we borrow a lot from the colon literature, but we continue to think about how can we learn about appendix cancer. Finally, I, I want to thank, you know, very much, you know, Carolyn and, and the work that she and her foundation are doing. And I will, I will tell you something, you know, when I speak, to, you know, on philanthropy, um, do not underestimate the critical importance of seed money and seed donations. Um, so yes, everyone wants to get the $4 million grant from the NIH and the $10 million, but I will tell you, if you want to get those grants, if you want to get the grants that allow us to sort of, you know, really do the big studies, they always start with $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, getting just that initial data. Because if you go to the government and you want $40 million, they're going to ask you for preliminary data. And that preliminary data, you know, can come from hiring a research tech, just these little things, you know, you know, which, you know, they don't look like 10 million, but 10, 20, 30, a $50,000 to your grant is absolutely critical uh, to us being able to actually apply for larger and larger uh, grants. So that seed money, you know, I, I can't tell you how important it is and should never, ever be underestimated. Um, whatever donation, $50, those things are, are, are very, very important and they may not, you know, seem like it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, how can I help with this, but, but you can. So. Now I'm going to uh, change gears a little bit and do something and ask you to do something that a uh, few people want to do, and that's think like me, um, right? So thinking like an oncologist, how do we sort of view the world? So one thing I'll tell you, and I'm going to pull from the colon cancer world, you know, but because of an incredible amount of work done in the labs and in patients who have been willing to go on clinical trials and allow us to move the field forward, this is what we've done in the colorectal cancer space. Um, and, and, you know, I'll even focus you, you know, here in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, when I was starting my, my, my residency and fellowship training, survival of a colon cancer patient was basically a year. Um, we are now over three years uh, for a metastatic colon cancer patient on average and have people who are living five and 10 years out. And again, you know, are we satisfied with this? Absolutely not because that means that there are a lot of people who are still dying from their cancers way too early in life. But this type of progress only happens with the dedicated work that you're gonna be hearing about today. So, as we like to say here at the University of Chicago, in God we trust, but everyone else requires data. Um, so we are a very data-driven place. Unfortunately, we get into appendiceal cancer and the data is hard to come by. And why is it hard to come by? Well there just aren't a lot of cases, right? And so um, you'll see that we tend to steal from the colon cancer literature 
we obviously are dedicated here to seeing if we can continue to move beyond that, um, and we'll talk about molecular analysis, you know, et cetera. But I think what you're gonna appreciate here is that an expert team um, is critical here, and that's the art of what we do, right? I mean, that's the stuff that, yes, you can look in guidelines, yes, the Chicago consensus is very important in educating people, but there's something about the gestalt when we look at things, um, looking at the patient when, you know, Dr. Eng or Dr. Taraga and I meet in the back hallway when we're seeing a patient together and put our heads together and say, you know, this doesn't quite fit a pattern, you know, we might have to sort of switch things around. So that's, that's what you get, you know, when you sort of bring us all together is, is, you know, sort of the art of what we do. So what do I care about? So when you, when you come in to see me, right, what am I looking at? Well, first of all, and this is you know, very important, is I'm looking at you, right? I, I tell patients, you know, the physical exam and you know, the medical students learn the physical exam, there's all these things they do and they have their stethoscopes and, you know, et cetera. For me, it's talking to you. How are you doing? How do you get up out of the chair, get up on, you know, and get up on the table? Tell me about what you're doing at home. Um, and you'll, you'll find we start asking the question. We're asking these questions because we're just trying to get a sense of how is the cancer affecting you, right? How is it affecting your body? What do I think you're going to be able to tolerate? You know, how aggressive do I think this cancer is? And in some ways, that is, is more important than what I see on the CAT scan, what I see in the pathology reports, you know, which obviously are all critical, but really looking at that patient and getting that sense of what is this cancer sort of doing to you um, is absolutely critical. So believe it or not, even though it may sound like chit chat and, you know, tell me what you're doing, all of that is actually information gathering um, on, our, on our part, and, and that's sort of why we do it. Pathology is king here. Um, it is, makes such a difference. Uh, and that's why we almost always are requesting that people bring us slides so that we can look at them, so they can be looked at by pathologists who basically do nothing else for a living but look at these type of cancers, um, because a wrong pathological diagnosis will lead us all in a very, very different direction. Almost every person that come here is going to have their tumor fully analyzed from a molecular standpoint. Um, and quite frankly, some of that we don't know what to do with yet but we put it into our databases and hope to learn what to do with that. But some of it is absolutely critical in our decision making. And, you know, we always, and, and you know, our, our schedulers and everybody try to do their best to be able to get the disks, but we always like to look at pictures. Um, looking at a report and reading a report really doesn't do anything for us, all right? We want to look at the scans and look at the pictures ourselves and we'll often then as a group come together and look at these things. Um, because again, those are critical things to our, to our decision making. So the terminology in this is, is, is downright confusing um, and it keeps changing. And I always, you know, I always have to go to Kieran to teach me what the latest and greatest is because again, I scratch my head. Um, and so you can imagine how hard this is for the regular sort of, you know, uh, oncologists and surgeons who don't see this for a living, even those who, who pay attention to this, are constantly going back to the guidelines and, you know, I'm pulling this stuff up. This is stuff that I have at the ready. The stuff on top is, are things that often, you know, will not come my way because it, the, 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 uh, the usual response is going to be surgery and maybe the hyperthermic, you know, uh, intraperitoneal therapy. But what we tend to look at are these kind of mucousy tumors. And this, again, this is where the pathology comes in. I'm going to talk more about this and how we think about this. But these are kind of some of the terms we're looking at, right? Mucus. And is it well differentiated? Is it poorly differentiated? Does it have signet ring cells? Um, and if you don't have a pathologist who is attuned to this and doesn't give us the right words, right, then I'm lost. Um, and again, so just going back to why we often, you know, burden everybody and say, please, we need the slides, because there are just some key words that we are looking for that mean so much to us in terms of, of, of determining therapy. So one of the, the dreaded terms that, you know, people hear about are the so-called signet ring cell, um, you know, and just so you understand terminology, it's, you know, we're not that intelligent. Um, this is a signet ring for those who remember one of these. Uh, you know, I think they were very popular in the 50s. Um, it, maybe people still rail them, but, but essentially that's what the tumor looks like under the microscope, right? It's this big mucus area. This is the nucleus. You know, here, this is the outside of the cell wall. So this is what we call a signet ring. Um, and again, having pathologists who can actually identify a true signet ring um, from a goblet cell, um, you know, these are, again, critical things, and they're very subtle differences, but they make a world of difference in terms of our, our sort of understanding. So when we talk about staging, um, you know, 
appendiceal and peritoneal cancers, again, operate by a slightly different, you know, set of, set of rules. So yes, we use traditional staging systems that we often will use um, in, you know, a lot of our colon cancers, et cetera. Um, but as an oncologist, you know, what I'm worried about is, of course, a lot of these diseases are already quote unquote metastatic, but they're metastatic in a very different way, right? They're spread regionally throughout the abdomen, but often aren't sitting in the middle of the liver or the middle of the lung. Um, you know, and again, getting your sort of mind around that being a very different entity is important. One of the things I do focus a lot on are, are lymph nodes. Um, when I see these cancers going to the lymph nodes, um, that always rings a little bell in the back of my brain that this is a slightly different cancer, right? Because often these cancers won't do that. Again, they'll spread. They'll spread all over the abdomen, but the, you'll, you'll take out, the, the, these guys will take out the right colon, and the lymph nodes will be fine. Um, when I see five, six, seven, eight lymph nodes involved, I now know I'm dealing with a, a, a cancer that's behaving by a different set of principles. Um, and then my chemotherapy that I recommend is very much directed by the fact that this isn't the usual actor, right? So these are the kind of, these are the arts of the things. You know, I'm, you know, we, we very much are trying to give personalities to these cancers and decide their aggressiveness, their likelihood to do bad things in the future that we can hopefully prevent. Um, and, and so these are some of the terms we, we look at. So, um, these are the histopathology, you know, kind of stuff, and, you know, I, I love my surgeons, so, and they actually, Kieran actually, I guess I said, probably knows much more about this than I do, so, uh, but uh, when, we, when we look at sort of adenocarcinomas, um, that they're non-mucinous and they're in the appendix, right? So they just tell me this is an adenocarcinoma, that's colon cancer, um, basically. Um, and so it may have started in the appendix, but we really think about it as colon cancer, and you know, we, we, we tend to sort of go along those ways. The second we start seeing the mucus stuff, now we're getting into these, these things that are, have a very high risk for peritoneal recurrence. Um, and, and this is often where, again, I'll, we'll rely on the surgeons to get it out, perhaps do the heated you know, intraperitoneal chemotherapy. <clears throat> again, if I see a lymph node, though, now I know I'm dealing with something else that has a higher risk for showing up somewhere else in the body. And that's where chemotherapy comes in, right? So chemotherapy comes in in treating small tumors that we can't see, um, you know, in this sort of setting. When I start seeing the tumors looking uglier and uglier under the microscope, then we start becoming more and more aggressive on our chemotherapy, often, you know, before, before surgery. Um, because again, we know these tumors, just by their look under the microscope, we can get a sense of how they're gonna behave. And the more worried we are about them, the more aggressive we tend to get you know, on our therapies. So you, you come into my world and you get uh, bombarded with our terminology. So full fox, uh, is, you know, you'll hear. And these are just our abbreviations for an old chemotherapy called 5 fluorouracil that we've refined how we've given over the years. Um, now people go home with a little pump um, and the chemotherapy infuses at home for 46 hours, um, and we give another drug called oxaliplatin, um, and essentially we just abbreviate this, this Fulfox. These are given every two weeks. Um, the main issue with the oxaliplatin um, that anybody here who's, who themselves or has had family members who have received this is this neuropathy, right? So, you know, actual numbness, and we, we grade things, um, and so we have a very standard set of tables. And when we grade something, that means a grade three neuropathy means you're now starting to have trouble to do things like buttoning shirts, um, tying your shoe, et cetera, right? So it's starting to interfere with your function. And we see very commonly, you know, about 12 to 15% of our folks will have some degree of neuropathy upon receiving this drug after three or four months. The good news is that it gets better in almost everybody, and in, you know, it's very rare for that degree of neuropathy to persist you know, beyond a year and a half, two years, but it does take time. Um, so it's reversible, but can take time. This is another regimen you'll often hear about, something called Full Fury. Um, very similar to Full Fox, same pump for 46 hours, but we just substitute the drugs. We give a different drug called the Renotecan instead of the oxaliplatin. This is given over two hours, again, once every two weeks. And then one that people will hear a lot about is something we either will call Fulfirinox or Fulfox Erie. They're the same thing. Um, and again, all we are doing now is, you know, we affectionately will call this the kitchen sink because it is still that five floor euro so that we talked about and it's the oxaliplatin and it's the arenotecan. So we've combined everything together in one regimen. Um, and you know, the idea here, and there's, and I'll show you some data on this, that when I have very aggressive tumors, this regimen seems to be the one where we, we are achieving some of our best results. Um, and obviously you're bringing in the toxicities uh, of both drugs. 
Um, now we get into some of the target agents, you know, when people have more spread disease, a drug called Bevacizumab, it goes by the trade name of Avastin. Um, and the idea behind this, and this has led to, you know, some Nobel Prize work um, that went into developing drugs like this, is that if you're a tumor and you want to grow, you need to be close to a blood supply, right? I mean, all life needs sort of, you know, the sustenance from, from the bloodstream. And so you've got a problem if you're a growing tumor, and that is, you know, the body right now has a static set of arteries and capillaries sort of feeding things. I want to grow. I need new arteries to come here and feed me. And so what they do is they release this um, hormone um, protein called, you know, vascular endothelial growth factor. And basically that is a signal to the artery and capillary producing cells to come and please make more of you so you can feed me. Um, what this drug does is it takes that stuff that's circulating, all that VEGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor that's circulating in the body, and it basically sucks it up like a vacuum. You know, so basically trying to stop it from getting new blood vessels to the tumor. Um, so this has been a very important component, um, and one we'll often do, we think that also helps in, you know, the tumors that produce a lot of fluid in the, in the abdomen and cause a lot of that ascites, that this drug also seems to help kind of decrease, you know, some of that fluid. And then we'll talk about drugs that, that hit this pathway, what we call the epidermal growth factor pathway. The way all these things work in the cell is they're sort of like the old, you know, they're sort of like if you play the old Chinese telephone game, you know, one thing tells somebody else, tells somebody else, tells somebody else, and eventually it gets down to the nucleus and tells it to reproduce, right? And what happens is sometimes the switches of these things are turned on, um, and they're constantly telling the DNA to reproduce itself. So we're, you know, we have drugs that basically block the antenna and say, just shut this whole thing down. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And these are, you know, just some of the antibodies that, that we tend to use. The big issue with this drug, you know, it's called the epidermal growth factor receptor for a reason. The epidermis is the skin. Um, there are a lot of these little receptors on the skin. So people tend to, you know, you, you get to be 17 again um, in that you get this sort of acne rash on the face, the chest, and the back. Again, we have ways to help prevent that and to treat it if it shows up, but, you know, that tends to be the, the issue. So now you start getting, now I'm going to get you kind of into the molecular world, right? So all these tubes, KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, mismatch repair, HER2, you know, it's, you know, it's everyone's biology nightmare, right? I mean, it's, it's stuff that you wish you never had to learn, um, but is absolutely critical to us as we start thinking about the best way to treat these tumors. Um, and, you know, again, this gets a little bit into the weeds, but it's very important for us when someone says, well, we checked KRAS, we checked NRAS, that I need to know what that means because, you know, four or five years ago, all that meant was checking this guy right here. Now all of these have to be checked, and all of these have to be checked, and this BRAF has to be checked. And so when I'm looking at the reports, A, if it hasn't been done, you'll see that we immediately are ordering it. Um, and if it has been done, I'm looking to make sure that they've actually done all the right stuff, um, because sometimes there are shortcuts that are taken on these things, um, less and less so, as this has become people have gotten educated on it. But, you know, just to let you know, it's not just someone gives me a report, just like the, you know, the imaging, you know, I don't just care that someone, a radiologist read it and told me there's no cancer. I'm going to look at it and confirm that for myself. It's not good enough for me to say, you know, oh, we checked these things and they're fine. I want to see it. I want to see the reports. I want to see what they checked um, and be able to know and be able to be very, very confident in that. So, you know, truthfully, the molecular understanding of appendix cancer, and these are, again, the type of things that we're trying to change here at the University of Chicago um, as we learn more and more, but we know that um, this sort of not having any of these mutations in some of these antibodies, we see it about 20 to 5 to 30 percent of our cases. I'll talk to you a little bit about how we think, again, from the colon world. Um, we used to think that the colon was one thing. Um, we've now realized that the right side of the colon, where the appendix, you know, kind of operates, and the left side of the colon are actually completely different. Um, now, we should have known, you know, our embryologists should have told us this because they actually come from very different parts of the embryo as they're developing, but we all made the assumption that they are all the same thing, and it turns out molecularly, you know, they don't look alike. And so now we're starting to learn that we need to treat things that start from the, re the right and the left, you know, very, very differently. Um, We'll talk about these kind of mutant cancers. You know, this is this sort of mismatch repair, MSI high. These are tumors that have a lot of mutations. More rare in appendix cancer, you know, from what we understand right now, see it maybe in about 5% of cases, 
But this is a critical thing for us to know because we'll, I'll show you some of the data on immune therapy um, and you know, what that's sort of achieving. And then, the, you know, fortunately, much more rare in appendix cancer than other right-sided colon cancer. So again, getting to the point of, well, the colon's not the same. The appendix probably just isn't a baby right colon, right? The appendix probably itself is its own sort of thing. Um, because usually on the right side of the colon, we tend to see a lot of these BRAF mutant cancers. We don't see as much on the appendix, um, fortunately, as I'll show you. And then, you know, we'll talk a little, you know, the signet ring cell are ones that we tend to give the aggressive chemotherapy to. So here's, you know, some of the data where, where, where side matters. And this was a large trial that uh, we participated in, and the details aren't all that important, other than to say, you know, we tried two different chemotherapies and, and wanted to see what happened. And what we found out that, first of all, um, right-sided colon cancers just didn't seem to do as well as left-sided colon cancers. So very surprising to us um, that right and left-sided colon cancers didn't sort of behave the same. And giving a therapy that otherwise, these two therapies, this drug called the cetuximab, which goes after that, you know, the antenna receptor, and the bevacizumab, which, go, which is the vacuum that kind of sucks up the VEGF, in the overall trial, those drugs looked absolutely equivalent. But when you looked at it by side, they behaved very differently. The cetuximab didn't work as well on the right side. So again, appendix sitting on the right side, this goes into our brain a little bit, right? And, and again, we, we certainly found that it just appears that, you know, bevacizumab, even in patients that don't have mutations, probably is a better drug for, for things that start on the right side um, than it is for things that start on the left side. So again, these are kind of the things that we put in, into our memory banks. These BRAF mutations, again, fortunately less common in appendiceal cancer, but they are one of our most dreaded foes. Um, this is a cancer that scares me um, when I see it. And, and the reason is, while I've showed you the graph of how wonderful things are going, you know, relatively speaking for colon cancer, and people are living three years, three and a half years, this one mutation can take people's life down to less than a year. Um, and, and so this is one that obviously there's an intense focus on. So one thing we found out is this is where the kitchen sink, right? Basically throwing all my drugs may help. And the point being, if you take a look at here, these are my BRAF mutant cancers. This is the survival of patients who got standard chemotherapy, right? Well, would be if you went to the textbook, give them 5-FU and arena TCAN or 5-FU and oxaliplatin, and they were living less than a year with that. We were able to double that um, by just adding one additional drug to it, right? So that's why I pay attention to this stuff, um, because it matters, right? It matters for patients, and very, um, you know, one last thing on Fulfoxiri is this is not an easy regimen to give. Um, now, we've been giving it for a long time, primarily actually because it has been a breakthrough combination for our pancreas cancer patients, and we obviously are a very large pancreatic cancer center. So we have learned how to do this, and... And I'm still surprised by the number of patients that I, that I see that come to me, they're on it, they're miserable, they're vomiting, you know, they will never get this drug again. I say, you know, can we treat you here for a couple cycles? And I can flip that around, right? By giving people the right anti-nausea medicines, by giving people anti-nausea medicines to take at home, by making sure that we see them very closely, uh, you know, day four, we see them. So again, this is all part of this team effort. My nurse, my nurse practitioners, you know, my pharmacist, you know, we're all sort of involved in thinking about how do I make sure people can get through the chemotherapy without being miserable. Um, so there is an art to it that, again, I try to educate my colleagues around, you know, the area and around the country as much as possible on. But, you know, we should be able to control your symptoms. You should, people should not be absolutely miserable going through chemotherapy anymore. Um, this is a recently uh, released trial. We still have not been published. Um, and going back to these BRAF, right, these sort of, you know, dreaded BRAF tumors, um, we, we tried actually, and this is a very common uh, mutation people see in melanoma, and in melanoma, they were able to give one drug, and actually a, a, a what's, you know, basically a, a something that a BRAF inhibitor, so a drug that goes after this BRAF mutation. It worked wonderfully in melanoma. We did it in colon, it was a complete failure. Didn't work. So the scientists kind of went back and said, well, why didn't it work? And what they realize is that in, in colon cancer, there are all these crosstalks, right? So I told you it's like this little sort of signaling telephone pathway. Well, if you block one thing, the cells are very smart about going in other directions and finding a different path to the, to the DNA. 
that's actually fortunate for us as a species, right? That's the reason we're around from an evolutionary perspective because if you know, our cells were dumb enough that one thing could stop them, none of us would be here, right? So we're thankful that it's from that standpoint, but cancer is our own cells fighting for survival, so they figured out clever ways around this. So we found some of that and said, okay, can we block all the different ways this thing is going around this? And so we came up basically with a three-drug regimen. None of this is traditional chemotherapy, I'll point out, right? None of this is the kind of just going after and you know, going after the DNA and people hair loss. All three of these are targeted therapies, so basically a non-chemotherapy regimen. And what we have found is that in a population that almost nothing worked, right? So if we gave the standard chemotherapy, which was given in this arm, less than 2% of the cancers showed any response. We were able to get that up to almost a third of the patients, having tumors getting smaller, people living longer, um, and so this has now become part of our armamentarium uh, in this cancer. Um, and again, this just kind of shows you where research, going back to the drawing board, doing something that we thought would work and it failed, and asking the, constantly asking the questions, why didn't this work? How can we make this better? Um, and so this is something, you know, again, are we excited about you know, survival's doubling or tripling? No, we want people cured. But this is the private progress we're making. A lot of people have heard about immunotherapy, and, and for good reasons, many of us are excited about the immunotherapy revolution. Um, we've always known biologically that the immune system does a wonderful job of killing cancer. Again, the reason most of us don't get cancer every single day is because the immune system does a really good job of finding out mutant cells and getting rid of them, right? Um, and unfortunately, right now, it's still a small number of folks, but what's the philosophy? Well, if you have a tumor producing a protein, right, that's abnormal, mutated, the body should recognize that as foreign, um, and the immune system should take it out. It's been beautifully designed over millions of years to do this, right, to find foreign things and get rid of them. Um, now, it helps if the tumor has lots of foreign things, because the more foreign things that are there, the easier it is for the immune system to sort of get at it. And so we do have some of our tumors that have spell checking problems that they just make all sorts of crazy bad proteins and the immune system does very good. And so I'll show you some of the data about you know, immune therapy doing that. A lot of work being done by our basic scientists here and in the clinic here on immune therapy is, well, how do we get these other tumors to respond? And if you're the colon, you know, what I always try to explain to people is like, well, why don't most colon cancers respond to this kind of stuff? Well, then again, you just put yourself in the place of a colon cell. What do you do for a living, right? What you do for a living is have a bunch of foreign stuff coming on the inside of you, the stuff that we eat and put in there and that, you know, gets deposited with the uh, Department of Sanitation eventually, right? Um, all that stuff is foreign. And if the immune system attacks things that were foreign all the time, our bowels would be attacked all the time by our immune system. So colon cells have gotten very smart at sort of telling the immune system, stay away, right? Just, this is not your problem, we got this, is what we do for a living, we don't need your help. Um, it's a problem, of course, when, the when they become cancer cells because they're doing the same thing. Um, but let me kind of show you the ones that, again, have a lot of these mutations. And this is a trial basically using two drugs that essentially take the brakes off the immune system. What cancers have done a very good job of is when the immune system comes in to try to attack them, they basically send signals out to say, no, 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 stop attacking us, stop attacking us. And they use a natural process that's in the immune system, which is you don't want the immune system constantly activated, right? You don't just want it you know, going on all the time because otherwise we'd be all miserable. We have flu all the time, essentially, right? Um, so you want it to activate and you want it to turn off. Well, again, as I told you, cancers are very smart in this regard. They've figured out a way to use that mechanism and say, you know what, time to shut off. No, we're good here, shut down. And, you know, again, through some great work by scientists, again, this was a Nobel Prize uh, from a, a physician at uh, MD Anderson this year who really developed and thought about a lot of this stuff, is we can now stop the tumors from sending those signals out. And what we have seen is that, again, just immune therapy, no chemotherapy, nothing else, we're starting to see over 50% of these tumors responding, shrinking to immunotherapy. And this is something we affectionately call a waterfall plot, which just shows you, you know, when we talk about something responding, what we mean is the tumor shrunk by at least 30%. But you can look at, there's other tumors, you know, almost 80% of these tumors had some shrinkage. And this one, again, for those who want to geek out, we call these a swimmer's plot. 
Um, but the point of the swimmer's plot is not only do people re respond, but the responses last. Because once the immune system gets activated, right, it stays activated, right? This is why vaccines work. Um, because, you know, it now will recognize the tumor no matter when it shows itself back up. So this is why there's so much excitement about this, is that we can give these drugs, probably eventually we can give them three or four times, and we might be able to cure a lot of metastatic cancers. We're seeing this in melanoma. We're seeing people with metastatic disease who are eight and nine years out that we think are probably cured from their cancer that a decade ago would have been dead in a year. Um, and we're starting to see this small percentage of cancers um, in the colon side do this. Obviously, you know, so if you start thinking like a scientist, the question is, how do we get the other ones to be responsive to the immune system? And that's a question we are asking here every single day and trying to do all sorts of different things, both on the vaccine side, stimulating the tumors to get the immune system. So there, there's just a never-ending effort to sort of ask the question, because yes, I would love this for to be every cancer patient. I could give them, I can get their immune system stimulated, not give them any toxic chemotherapy and have their cancers cured, right? I mean, that is, you know, to me, a, a sort of a dream world. So just kind of summarizing my approach to all this, you've got a well-differentiated cancer, you know, you probably don't need me. Um, if there's no lymph node involvement, I send you to my fine colleagues, they get it out, decide, you know, whether heated chemotherapy is needed. Um, these sort of moderately differentiated or slightly ugly, but they don't have that signet ring cell thing in there, we'll give you, you know, chemotherapy. We often will give you chemotherapy for a few months, try to get the tumor shrunk a little bit, make sure nothing else develops in the body, and then send it to Dr. Anger Taraga to get it out, and then we'll usually give a little chemotherapy on the back end to essentially clean up um, any small cells that we can't see. When I see the ugly ones, the signet ring cell, the BRAF mutant cancers, those are ones that you find us saying, we really want to give you very aggressive chemotherapy up front, anywhere from three to six months, often longer again to try to get the tumor shrunk and to make sure that it doesn't misbehave. Because what we don't want to do is send you to surgery and then a month later find out the tumor is in 14 places in someone's body. We haven't done anybody any good there, right? We've put you through an operation. Um, and the cancer has grown. So we try as much as possible to select the patients that we think will benefit from our procedures, right? So if you don't need chemotherapy, I don't want you getting it. If you don't need surgery, I don't want you getting it, right? But if it's gonna help you, you know, and I can identify that, then let's put all those things in place. <clears throat> What's gonna be a discussion, I think, going forward here today, and you're gonna hear a lot more on, is how do we follow you? And this is, I know, a frustration. It's a frustration for us, and it's a frustration um, for, for many of you, right? Which is, we do this imaging, we get these blood tests, but we still really can't tell you whether the cancer's back because, gee, the peritoneal disease hides on us. So again, Dr. Taraga is working with our radiologists here. We're trying to find better ways to image these cancers to see if they can come back. But I'll tell you one of the exciting things happened on the oncology side, and it's not quite ready for prime time, but I think it will be um, as soon as we work out a few kinks. Um, is this idea of circulating tumor cells. So it turns out when you have a cancer in your body, the cancer actually spits those cancer cells into the bloodstream. We now, and again, to me, this is you know, Star Trek type crazy technology, we are now able to extract those tumor cells. Um, we can do DNA analysis on them from the blood, but most importantly now we're able to measure them. And there's more and more data coming out saying, look, if you've gotten chemotherapy and surgery and you don't have any tumor cells circulating 30 days after surgery, you're probably in pretty good shape. And you may not actually need any more chemotherapy from me, right? And we can just follow to see if there's tumor cells in the body. If there aren't tumor cells there, people are probably fine. The second we see tumor cells, there's good evidence now mounting that those are patients that we really worry are gonna have a recurrence or may already have their cancer sort of back. So is this a group of patients that we should start giving more aggressive chemotherapy to? Again, there are a few um, kind of more logistical as well as scientific details that need to be worked out, you know, exactly which tumor cells are we looking for, do they need to be individualized, et cetera. But I, I very much predict that in, in the near future, this is what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be getting your blood and we're gonna be looking for these tumor cells floating around. Um, and again, you'll hear a little bit more about this later, some of the work that we're starting to do on that, uh, because it is. It, I, we, we get that sitting there and telling you we don't think your cancer's back, but 
we don't really have much faith in our imaging or these other blood tests we're doing, so we're just going to keep watching, and maybe we'll go in there with another surgery and look to make sure it's not back. Uh, we hope to be able to put away with that and be able to tell you definitively at a visit there are no cancer cells circulating in your blood. That's a really good sign that's for us that your cancer is not coming back right now, okay? And we'll see you in three or six months. So with that, right, obviously we need to move beyond thinking of appendix cancer like colon cancer. We only can do that by the efforts of all of you um, and the dedication that you give to letting us do research biopsies and store things so that we can learn as a group. And we do. We have a good group around the world that thinks about these things and everyone's collaborating more um, because, yeah, again, we want to understand appendix cancer, you know, that is not, again, just a, sort of a baby colon. Um, we obviously need to benefit which cancers are going to, you know, benefit from aggressive surgery or aggressive chemotherapy. My point earlier, I don't want to give you something aggressive if either it's not going to help you, you know, or, you know, you know, it's likely to cause you harm. And the same thing with surgery. You know, Dr. Tarag and Ang don't want to go in and do six, seven-hour surgeries if, at the end of the day, this is not going to help you live longer and live better. And so we need to get a better job of sort of predicting that. Obviously, we need to figure out which of our chemotherapies work and when. You saw some of the molecular data we're doing, trying to do that. But we continue to need to be able to refine so that if I'm going to give you chemotherapy, I'm giving you the right chemotherapy. And then obviously, we need to you know, figure out you know, when the tumor is coming back and can we intervene or are our therapies working. And finally, again, uh, you know, a lot of our investigational work here in our so-called phase one is trying to get tumors that do not respond to immunotherapies, how do we get them to respond? So we're working on vaccines, we're working on injecting tumor cells, um, there's all sorts of things that are happening, again, from the knowledge that we're gaining from our colleagues here at, you know, one of the best research institutions in the world, the work that they're doing in the lab, and bringing it as quickly as possible to the clinic um, to see if, if we can sort of change this paradigm. But most importantly, you know, Having you all participate in research, I can't just tell you how important it is to us. We don't get, we're not where we are right now without patients and families willing to commit uh, to research, and we're not going to move forward unless we have all of your support and the future patients to come to allow us to learn. Because again, if we're not learning from each patient, then we are failing um, in the system. So with that, I thank you so much for your time. Uh, and if we have time, happy to take questions. If not, I'll, I'll be around because I want to learn today too. So. But um, I think in the interest of time, we might hold questions. But if you guys have questions specifically for Dr. Polite, uh, you'll have emails of, uh, of Pujita and myself. Please feel free to shoot us those emails. We'll forward them along to Dr. Polite and, and get back to you. Um, I think um, we may head on to our next talk, unless you guys want to take a quick break for some coffee. Um, are there many coffee? Do folks want to break right now, or do you want to go for another talk? I don't see many heart. And so, all right, we'll go to our next talk. Our, our next speaker is Dr. Petroda. Dr. Petroda is a radiation oncologist, um, but again, one of the, uh, one of the most um, intelligent people that I've met. He, at a young age, has actually done some remarkable work, has published in some of the most uh, major journals that we have. Um, his work is focused around trying to find cancers and their, and their types that may respond differently than we think. How do you personalize? the effects and identify cancers that do well uh, and don't do well. And in the lab, he has a lot of work on, on again, immune mediation and how do you get these cancers to work well on that. Um, he's, it's a delight to have him here. For those of you that were here last year, you heard his wonderful talk last year as well. Um, so welcome, Sean. Thank you. First and foremost, I want to thank you for just giving me the opportunity to share some work that we're really passionate, very excited about. Um, most of the work that I'm going to show you today is in colon cancer, but uh, as many speakers have alluded to, there are some similarities and the, the approaches that we use uh, overlap very uh, intricately with those in appendix cancer, and so we're really trying to advance our knowledge of metastatic disease as it relates to some uh, uh, similar uh, diseases here. Uh, I'm a radiation oncologist. I actually don't see very many appendix cancers. Um, we would love to uh, work closer clinically, but my main focus is predominantly in understanding metastatic cancer and really challenging the paradigm uh, that has really prevailed in oncology for many decades, that metastatic cancer is incurable. And what I want to convey to you today is that if we find the right ones um, using 
uh, integrated approaches of clinical and molecular information, we actually are making a lot of progress to find folks who may benefit from more aggressive approaches and may be cured with uh, their metastatic disease. So today I want to, uh, there are two learning objectives that I want to convey today. One is to understand that when we talk about metastasis, there's no, there's no single disease called metastasis. It's really a whole spectrum of disease um, that differ in the biological underpinnings from indolent disease, less aggressive, less likely to spread, to more aggressive disease that may present or may develop into widespread uh, cancer. And so we need to understand what distinguishes the disease that's more indolent to that which is going to be more aggressive. And secondly, what I want to share with you is that understanding the biology of the disease is likely to get to the point of that whole spectrum idea. And so by, uh, by characterizing the biology of metastatic cancers, we're going to be able to better make the, help you make decisions about how aggressive to be um, with your disease, and hopefully use that information to optimize therapy for, for many folks. So as you are well aware, metastasis accounts for about 80 to 90 percent of death related to cancer. It is really one of the most dominant challenges in cancer therapy. Why metastasis does this is because it compromises vital organ function, and eventually patients will succumb as a result. Generally, metastatic cancers are considered to be widespread uh, and incurable. Um, and typically, metastatic cancers are treated with systemic approaches like chemotherapy, hormonal manipulation, targeted therapies. And in some instances, like Dr. Polite alluded to, you, we can cure some folks, especially with immunotherapy. But by and large, most patients, unfortunately, cannot be cured with systemic therapies. And these are only meant to prolong life, but, all, but mostly to relieve symptoms. And there are some subsets, um, as have been uh, previously reported, that are cured with approaches like immunotherapy. The biology of metastasis is very complex. Um, simply put, tumors spread from their primary site via the lymph nodes or the bloodstream generally to gain access to other sites uh, distantly. And Interestingly, the process of metastasis is actually very inefficient. Of the cells that actually leave the primary tumor, less than about 1% of them actually can get to the other, the distant site and grow and uh, proliferate. And so what is it that, what is it that uh, allows those tumor cells to gain those functions to leave the primary site and, take, and colonize those distant uh, areas? And it's likely to be different if the tumor cell can get to the lymph node versus the bone versus the brain, there are different features that allow tumor cells to do that. And so the idea that I want to convey today is that even though tumor cells have to gain these abilities, not all tumors gain those abilities in the same way. Some are better at metastasizing than others. And so this whole idea is that in some folks, the tumors are not very proficient at metastasizing, and they may actually only produce one or a few sites of metastasis. Whereas in other uh, folks, tumor cells have really acquired a, a very proficient uh, manner of metastasis, and those folks tend to develop many sites. Can we identify those patients where a single or only a few sites are going to develop? And if we can, can we aggressively treat them with surgery, with radiation, some combined approaches, and actually eradicate all of the disease? And what I want to propose to you is that that is in reach. And here at the University of Chicago, we're doing a lot of work to make that a, a standard approach. And so typically, the paradigm has been that local treatments, such as radiation or surgery, have primarily been palliative, because um, with less effective chemotherapies decades ago, we weren't able to make that big leap. Now with more effective chemotherapies and targeted agents, localized approaches such as surgery and radiation have an even bigger uh, impact than they had in the previous days. And so we propose that by understanding the clinical factors combined with the molecular features, 
we're going to be able to better distinguish those folks who are going to have limited spread of their cancer versus widespread disease. And, and possibly those who have limited spread may actually be curable with localized approaches. So we studied this in folks who were treated here over the past roughly two decades who had liver metastases as their only site of metastasis from colon cancer. And these patients received uh, chemotherapy as well as surgery to their primary tumor and all of the visible sites of metastasis. Typically, patients had one to three liver metastases. And all sites of disease were optimally treated with these approaches, and no other sites were visible after this treatment paradigm. Half of the patients had metastatic disease at the same time as their primary, known as synchronous disease. The other half developed metastatic cancer after their primary tumor had already been treated appropriately. And what we found is that one-third of patients in our cohort never recurred again. After this aggressive treatment, one-third were cancer-free. And those patients at 10 years had roughly about 80% survival. By contrast, the other two-thirds had recurrent disease, but in some folks it was very slow, and other it happened more quickly. Those folks had a 10-year survival only about 15%. Our task was to figure out, can we explain why these folks had better outcomes while other folks had inferior outcomes? And can we use this to predict in the future how uh, folks may do as a result of these treatments? We published this paper last year, and what we showed is that by integrating molecular data at the DNA level, so looking at mutations, structural changes in the DNA, microsatellite instability or mismatch repair. Uh, Dr. Polite re referred to uh, that previously. In combination with RNA, which is kind of a downstream uh, message, almost a photocopy of the DNA, um, as well as some of the protein, we were able to integrate all this very uh, robust molecular data to identify which cohort of patients that we treated were the ones that were likely to be cured. And so our analysis, um, our unbiased analysis led to the discovery of three molecular subtypes of colorectal liver metastases. We denoted them as a canonical subtype, an immune subtype, and a stromal subtype. Roughly, each of these subtypes constituted about one-third of the cohort, but they were drastically different at the molecular level. And let me take you to, through this. So our canonical subtype um, was exemplified by signatures that reflected the tumors having increased proliferation, growing very rapidly, very little immune cells and very little stroma around the tumors were present. There were specific mutations that were identified in this cohort. And interestingly, the, the survival of this cohort was intermediate, meaning that half of the patients seemed to do well, half the patients not so well. By contrast, we identified a group that did very well that was exemplified by having enrichment for certain immune features. And so you'll hear a lot about the immune system, both as it relates to the curability of patients after surgery, but also the potential for response to immunotherapies. This cohort made up uh, about a third of patients and had a huge influx of immune cells, mostly cells that are known to be very important for fighting off tumors called T-cells. These patients were less likely to develop the recurrence after their surgery, and their survival was the best of all of the subtypes. The last group was the worst performing subtype called the stromal group. These patients, um, even though they presented with generally one to three uh, liver metastases, were very likely to develop many more afterwards. And they were enriched by some of those features like uh, angiogenic uh, signatures, which reflected you know, increased blood vessels growing in the tumor and uh, proficient uh, abilities of the tumor to leave the primary site and colonize other areas. These patients were very likely to develop more metastases after their therapy. What was fascinating is that when we took the biological features and we combined them with clinical and pathological features after the patients had the surgery, we identified a group 
that we call low risk, and the survival of these patients at 10 years was 95%. About 25% of patients end up falling into this group, and these were primarily patients who had a good immune response, who had favorable features on their pathology. By contrast, you can see that there was an intermediate group with a roughly a 45% survival and a high-risk group with roughly about a 15% survival. This was purely based on biological data and clinical data, integrating the two to predict the optimal outcomes for these patients. So one could, one could uh, make a, a presumption that presumably low-risk patients might be the most likely to benefit from localized approaches like surgery. And in fact, what was actually very interesting is that if you look at the low-risk patients, half of them actually recurred. So even after you take a very aggressive approach of removing the primary tumor, getting chemotherapy, removing all the liver mets, half of them will develop another liver met. But it turns out that every time those patients develop a, another sided disease, it was always limited. It was never widespread. It never occurred outside the liver. And it, it was always, almost always salvageable, meaning they could have another operation. And then uh, many of them never, were, had never had another side of recurrence. They were by and large cured. So the number of times those patients are going to recur was strongly dependent on these subtypes. And in addition, where the patients were re going to recur, whether just in the liver, in the liver, in the lung, in the peritoneum, really mattered based on what the biology of the tumor was uh, under uh, these analyses. Similar types of work are being done by other groups, and Dr. Turaga and our group are really working closely together to validate these findings of colorectal liver metastasis subtypes in peritoneal disease. Maybe the subtypes are exactly the same. Maybe there's some um, new subtypes that are uh, waiting to be discovered that we could then integrate with clinical features to then better predict um, those folks who are really going to be cured, who are going to uh, not have any further recurrences compared to those uh, patients where maybe a more aggressive treatment up front is warranted. And so currently we're, we're actually working with many groups, um, many of them internationally, to validate the findings from our work here. And it could really I think changed the paradigm of how we think about uh, colorectal liver metastasis and I think metastasis generally. We're working on potentially using this data to even restage patients. So not saying that there's one stage of metastatic cancer, but really subdividing that out to better inform how we treat uh, patients. And we're having we're getting a better understanding of the composition of the tumor and host factors that ultimately contribute to those outcomes after metastatic treatment. And the, together, all this information is really helping us better integrate the systemic therapies, which are crucial, to the local therapies like surgery and or radiation to give you guys a better chance of really getting optimal outcomes uh, after treatment. What I'd like to conclude with is that the work here and by others really indicate that metastasis is not one disease. It's a whole spectrum of disease. And we are, I think, at the forefront at really trying to understand the biology of that. And a lot of work is really ongoing to uh, give us more information about these biological uh, features. Subsets of patients are going to have limited spread of metastasis. And those are the patients that we really can you know, cure. By understanding these clinical and genetic features, we're really going to inform uh, therapy in the future and really challenge the, the current paradigms of treatments. And taken together, uh, our, our conception is that we really think that the potential for cure of some patients with metastatic cancer is really within reach. And so with that, I, I really thank you for your time and uh, would love to take any questions that you have. Thanks, Sean. And I think, you know, just to frame this for, for those of you um, that would like to kind of think about how we think about this for appendix cancer, the, the, the reason this work is so groundbreaking is that, number one, it tells us that not all patients with stage 4 cancer are the same. Number two, it tells us that there may be patients in whom, even though the cancer comes back within a year after a big CRS and HIPEC, 
when we as doctors are just sitting and looking at these folks and we say, oh, you know, your cancer has come back so fast and this is not, you know, this may not be a good sign, they may benefit from a second surgery and even a third surgery if we can find those exact patterns. And so I think it's really important as our research moves forward. Um, but I have a question for you, Sean, and I don't know if you're at liberty to answer this yet. But, you know, we hear a lot about the microbiome. You know, we have this whole big microbiome institute here. And, um, I know you've done some work with that. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about the role of bacteria, viruses, and fungi in actually metastases? Absolutely. I think there was a really seminal paper published uh, about a year ago from Harvard where they showed that specifically in colorectal cancer, um, it's, it has been known that there are, colorectal cancer is actually uh, a, a, a kind of a microenvironment of tumor cells, of stromal cells, of immune cells, and bacteria. Because bacteria are, are there are actually more bacteria in and around your body than there are human cells. It's pretty striking. And so what they actually found is that in liver metastases from colorectal cancer, you have almost exactly the same bacteria you have in the primary tumor. What, we, what we're working on is actually related to that. We actually found that the bacteria in the liver metastases help determine what molecular subtype the patient falls into. And on top of that, actually provides complementary information. So if I were to take the bacterial composition of your tumor, combine it with the molecular information, I can predict with very high accuracy the survival of the patients that we studied in our cohort. So the bacteria play some very critical role, and we're experimentally trying to validate that in animal models. But I think that could really revolutionize uh, therapy because if you are, for, for some reason or another, have a bad bacteria, can we eliminate that? And would that then promote some favorable response that might help you have a you know, better outcome after aggressive therapy. And I think this is fascinating. Fascinating work. I don't think we have the answers, but you know, stay tuned for their lab because this is critical. Um, is we're finding it's not just the conventional ways that we think about these cancers that matter, but it's how your immune system works against it and the bacteria as well. So Dr. Petroda will also be available by email if you guys have questions. Well, let's take a quick five-minute break for, for toilet, refreshment, coffee, et cetera and then we'll reconvene for the panel. Thanks, here.